Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse basketball player Sonny Spera. I talked with Sonny about his playing days, how he almost transferred after his junior year, and his memories of Pearl Washington. Well, welcome back to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. And uh, I'm really looking forward to today's uh, <laughs> podcast and with my guest, it's uh, former Syracuse basketball player, Sonny Spera. Uh, Sonny, how are you, sir? Mike, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm guessing that the guest list we've gone through, you know, and now we're down to this tier. This is a good thing. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, what I enjoy about this podcast is I get to talk to, okay, you know, some of the all-time greats yeah. in Syracuse history, like Derek Coleman and Billy Owens. But I also get to talk to folks who just, are still interwoven in the history of SU basketball, you know, and, you know, folks like yourself, uh, Matt Gorman was a a guest on a wonderful guest. And he had great stories of, you know, the, the championship year and Jerry McNamara's tales and and his own career. So no, I look forward to talking to anybody Uh, and you, I, I, like I said, I can't wait to dig in on on some of your, your memories and stories of your days (laughs) here at Syracuse. Well, thank you. No, I was just busting a little bit, but I know you've had some great, great guests. And, it, you know, like all like all colleges, you know, you have a there's an affinity and, and, and there's definitely a brotherhood when you come through the same program. And for us, 99 percent of us have played for the same coach. So we're very fortunate. That's a pretty common denominator, you know, and until Bernie, you know, until Bernie was, you know, dismissed and he should still be there. But that's another story. But Bernie was always there, too. So you had two rock solid, steady people, you know, throughout. And that's just unheard of in in today's day and age. You know, and you mentioned this. And by the time the podcast airs, uh, the weekend will have passed. But uh, the Syracuse Louisville game at the Carrier Dome on Saturday, Mm -hmm. February 5th is the annual alumni game, the alumni day. And and you're kind of one of the, the guys that spearheads this this effort to make sure that the the former players stay connected and and then have a chance to return every year. Um, you must enjoy that role, though, to be because you get to stay in touch with all of your, you know, not just your former teammates, but everybody who's played at Syracuse. Yeah, I think, you know, a couple things. Bernie was the glue. So Bernie did a lot of that. Mm-hmm. And he's not you know, affiliated as he was, he's still, he's still in contact with everybody. Everybody gets a birthday call. Everybody gets a call from Bernie at at different times. He's still connected to everybody that I know that have played there, but that part is not there as much. And the second thing was when Pearl passed away and we had that, that on floor dedication in the dome and they had a nice uh, dinner and evening and they started, uh, I think it was a fund that they were raising some money to help various areas. And, I just hit me. I was like, you know what? This is what Pearl wanted. Like there was a tremendous turnout, tremendous outpouring of alumni. And I just said, you know what? This is something I'll, I'll pick up. I'll pick up the, you know, the, I'll, I'll pick up the pen and paper or whatever it is, the, the shovel, whatever it is, the shovel, whatever. It is. I'll pick up, you know, the, the cross. I don't want to use that. That's not really fair, but I'll, I'll pick up the journey and I'll, I'll volunteer. I talked to Mr. Wildhack, John said, Hey, I, I'm, I'll volunteer to be a liaison and I'll work hard on my end. And I had relationships with Jimmy Lee and Matt Gorman. You mentioned Matt um, and guys in different generations and, you know, Billy and Derek and, and those guys that I think if we split this up, say, okay, you know, Rex, Hey Rex, can you get guys in the sixties? Hey Jimmy, can you get the guys in the seventies? I'll work with Howard and Wendell and Raph and we'll get the eighties group and those guys. And, you know, Matt and, and you guys and, and Billy and Derek, can you guys work on the 90s? And then, you know, and, and, and you know, that would be the best way to do it. So we, we got that started. And, and, you know, honestly, we're probably the only school that has such a continuity at the head of the steward. You know, our, our captain, Coach Beheim, has been there, you know, on the ship. So why don't we get everybody together? And to me, it was it's kind of labor of love. It's, it's challenging at times because I've got, you know, we all have, we, it's 2022. Everybody's got busy lives, you know? So, you know, with three balls in the air, it's okay to put a fourth one up there and we'll figure it out. So that's what we're doing. And it's been a lot of fun. And I stay very connected with like my generation of guys. And we see each other often down the shore, Jersey, 
you know, we get back, Howard and I just went down to the Duke game and, and, and we went to the Villanova game and a bunch of us got together and we got together with some Villanova guys. And then that's, you know, been another thing that I've enjoyed doing is, is getting that podcast and that thing going with Chuck. And Chuck really is the one that did a lot of this at Villanova. And I, I've asked him a ton of questions and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get that, that same continuity. And there's a lot of love amongst us. But I, I just think we need a little more organization. So I, I volunteered, and I, but I'm not doing it alone. We've got great people. Peter Corisanti, the, the basketball ops guy, I've known his family forever, and I've become very good friends with Peter when he was at Binghamton too. And that's been a very nice transition. And he's, he has absolutely volunteered and stepped forward and said, hey, I'll, I'll take this in-house now. And he's, he's doing it the first time. And we've had to work around the pandemic. We've had a worker and we were ready to come up. Uh, we were shooting for January game, uh, the Florida state game and everything was, there was no food. They were talking about no you know, crowd were going to be either eliminated or not. So that wasn't a good time. So then we said, okay, what do we got left? Louisville. It's a two o'clock game. Let's try that. Uh, the Duke game that was not on the, that was not on the negotiating table, uh, <laughs> but uh, every other game was. So, you know what? It just seemed to be like, let's, let's do this one. So that's what we're all coming for. And How many former players uh, do, were you expecting to have there at that Louisville game? Uh, we are expecting anywhere from 10 to 20 players and about 10 to 20 of the various personnel managers and, and those kind of folks. And, and now that that's players. And I don't know if wives and families are coming, but, you know, trying to put something together and club 44 is not open. So we're trying to do something at the Marriott afterwards. And Billy Owens helped set that up beautifully at the Marriott. So we got a room and uh, um, it's going to be very casual and, and, you know, very, I'm, I'm trying to keep it personal so that everybody can sit and talk to each other and, you know, reconnect. Cause that's what, that's what we all want to do. You know, you, uh, you grew up in the Binghamton union Endicott area. Uh, yep. what made you decide to go to Syracuse? Well, my teammate from high school went there, Sean Carrots. So when they saw Sean, they saw me. Uh, I love their style of play. I like the fact that they got up and went because my high school was slow down, take the ball, take the ball up and get the ball inside and get the ball inside. And then after and get the ball inside. <laughs> so if you wanted to play, guess what you did? <laughs> you got the ball inside. So, <laughs> so I had a lot of assist records and steal records, but it was mostly focused on that. So I was a distributing point guard. And to me, oh, wow, this is going to be a little more open. I'll be able to do a little more of what I think I can do. And at 6'5", you know, that kind of gave me a little bit of an advantage because I was able to, you know, get a little size too to the position. And they had, you know, Jeannie was there and myself. So I was like, okay, I think I could see myself and Jeannie kind of split in this role and maybe – at some point I'll go one, he'll go two, or I never thought the other way, but as, as it turned out, now when we bring in Pearl Washington, Jeannie and I better think long and hard about going to the two or sitting our panties down more. So uh, <laughs> that, that was the plan, you know, so that wasn't the initial plan, but that was the plan and being close to home. And then the academics were huge. So when I met with um, Margaret Brown was the pre-health advisory. And I remember meeting with her and I, I didn't know they had that. And it was brand new. And I said, well, I want to go to dental school. What's, what's that like? And what's your acceptance rate? And she said, well, we don't have a lot of facts and figures, but seven out of eight or eight out of nine students that applied went. And I was like, that's pretty good odds. You know? So that's a, that's a good chance if I go here and do what I'm supposed to academically, that I can go on to the profession that I was planning. And I think it worked out pretty well. Yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit, your, uh, your practice Thank um, you. after school. But you mentioned a guy there, Pearl Washington. Now yeah. you came up, you had your freshman year. Pearl yep. was a, at that point in time, a senior in high school. Um, he was a junior. He came in my junior year. Oh my God. That's right. You had two years. Yeah. I played two years. Yep. So do you remember, like, you remember like the first time you heard about Pearl or saw him or <laughs> maybe yeah. even the first time you played with him and like together at, at SU? The first time I saw Pearl, I didn't see him on his visit. I don't know if he even made an official visit, but the first time I saw Pearl was on the Al McGuire announcement show. Yes. Where Pearl was going to decide. And we all got together. And at that time, there was no cable TV on campus. You got three channels and you had to have a good antenna to get that third one, you know, and that was hard. And so I remember we were at someone's house um, and we were watching the show. 
And, and and Pearl, in typical Pearl fashion, but not knowing him, just very humble. And, you know, I decided to go to Syracuse. You know, I remember how he pronounced it and everything. And I remember Al McGuire, oh, when are you going to go there for all that snow? And we were all like, hey, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> um, but I do remember I looked over at Jeannie. I was like, hey, things are going to change, you know? So that was, you know, the start of something. We had no idea what that was going to be like. And now some other guys, I think, did. Probably Raf had a little idea. Wendell, guys who played in the city and had played with Pearl in the various um, the wheelchair classic and um, the college student um, thing that he played with Chuck in and the city and stuff. So there's a, there's a ton of, you know, of people who knew of and probably hosted him. But I didn't meet Pearl until he came to campus. And then. Okay. Then, then you start reading about him. I mean, the guy had two nicknames. He was Pac-Man, you know, and he was Pearl. And he had he had two big gold chains, you know, big one that said, you know, Pac-Man. And I was like, well, that's my defensive nickname. I was like, oh, damn. This is I have never tough. heard Pac-Man before. Oh, yeah, Pac-Man, because he'd gobble everybody. He'd gobble it up. He would steal the ball from everybody. So he was Pac-Man on defense, and he was Pearl, named after, obviously, Pearl Monroe. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, wow, this guy comes in. And then he came in, he had that big sheepskin you know, warm that jacket. I was like, Oh man, that looks so warm. You know, I said, he's got it right. He's not even living in New Syracuse yet. So he, he came in with this appearance of off the chart, glam, glitz, bling, the whole deal. But man, he, he was nothing like that in person. He was truly humble and courteous and he always had time for people and, and everybody wanted a piece of him. Everybody wanted a piece of his time. Everybody wanted a piece of Pearl. And he had a young son, uh, DA, who's Dwayne. Um, I remember, you know, changing the diapers, to be honest with you. Uh, well, my girlfriend did. I was kind of like, that's how you do that. So that was <laughs> that was in the apartment. And I, I do remember looking and saying, damn, I, I got all I can do to manage my school and, and, and basketball. And now I have a girlfriend. He's got a son. He's got he's got the weight of everything, and he's got this entire team and community on his back. So that's a lot. And man, he just just smooth and humble as can be. And it's really who he is. That's who he was. And um, you know, and then when he got sick, and just tough. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you were on the court with him? Um. I do. It was in Manly Fieldhouse. It was at the conditioning for basketball. And I know he wanted to be anywhere but on the conditioning floor. And we weren't really excited about it either. But we were like, you know, this guy's great. Like, there's no like he didn't he did not put out in those situations. He did what he had to do to get by. And he also wore pro keds. And I remember that. And I was like, wait a second. We all got Nikes. This was a big deal. He's wearing pro kids. He got his own sneaker contract, you know, and he kind of did somewhere, somehow. And he wore them in games and stuff. And then I was like, oh, this, this is this is it, man. We're in a different world now, you know. But that's where I really, you know, Pearl. But then if you were going to play a competitive game, that's when you saw the smiley, the head bobbing, moving, and, you know, just just chugging along and just unstoppable. You knew what he was going to do and you definitely weren't going to stop it you know it's just true i mean I, I he shook guys and made guys fall and he went up into big guys that i thought oh they're just going to block it because he wasn't a great jumper mm -hmm. but guys never got a piece of that ball i mean not only they get a piece of he, he went right over ewing he went over some phenomenal big guys in our league and i was like i don't know how he does it because i'm six five and i'm not really going over that guy i'm going to try to pull up and do something different it just was amazing what he could do with the basketball. And he had fun. He just had fun. He had that smiles electric. You know, there he had that shot in 1985 at the Carrier Dome to beat Georgetown. The fans stormed the court. Uh, you know, he had yeah, the half-court shot against BC. Yep, shot against BC. You know, then, he, of course, he had the run-in with Patrick in the, in the Big East tournament in 85. Yep. Any of those? Would, what's the moment that, that stands out to you? Is it one of those three or is there another one out there? Well, those are those were big moments, you know, like the, the one with him hitting the shot at half court and then the dedication of the floor and having his number in that spot that you've seen a million times. Right. Right. So 
you, 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 you get reminded of it, but the actual physical moments that I remember were, they were smaller, more subtle, like, like definitely in the, in the garden, when, 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 when we were at the garden, number one, all of a sudden we didn't get too many tickets. Pearl had a whole bunch of tickets. So there wasn't <laughs> a lot of tickets for other guys. And I had a lot of my families from Staten Island. So, um, but it was, the garden was different. It was a different, and we had played there my freshman year in Hartford and the next three years were in, 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 in Madison Square. And the year before that, we lost to BC in the quarters or semis or something. And then we got Pearl and we're, we had a great year as freshman year. And I think it was the finals against Georgetown. And I just remember him shaking guys to the ground and just guys standing. Like he, he, he weaved through traffic like there was nothing. And I remember Gene Smith, who was probably one of the best on-ball defenders, Michael Jackson, these guys from Georgetown who were notorious on-ball defenders, guys in your face, turning everybody in the country over. And Pearl went through them like they were they were JV basketball players. And it was like, oh man, he, he you know, he's he's got it going. Let's just make sure we stay in his vision somewhere and you know, and just be there and, you know, do what we got to do on the other side, but just what he was able to do in those moments and electrifying and just, yeah. The, the other moment, the one with P Patrick, I didn't see Pearl get Patrick, but I saw Patrick haul off and take that swing at Pearl. And I was like, Oh, thank God he pulled back. Cause he, he was going down on that one. That was a full roundhouse, full horse. If he hit him, we'd probably have a different conversation about Pearl now, but he, he didn't. And, um, but you know why did Pearl do what he did? Well, because when per when Pearl cut through the lane, they gave him the old Georgetown hug, which was a a, a forearm shiver right in the in the in the what the solar plexus, the ribs, the chest, whatever part of the body they were going to hit. You were not going untouched through that lane. The Georgetown hug, I love it. <laughs> yeah, they, I'm sure they call it other things. You know what's funny is we interviewed Billy Martin, and we interviewed Michael Graham, we talked to all these guys and stuff, and they would say there was a little incident in that game. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, incident? That was a brawl. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the famous Michael Graham in, in Syracuse. He's the infamous Michael Graham. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Him and Andre. We had Andre and, and Michael on together. It was hysterical. See, you, you got if if listen, I want everybody to continue listening to my <laughs> podcast, but I also encourage you and the Big East Rewind with, with Sonny and Chuck, uh Chuck Everson. Because of you, you guys are, as players, you get these guys on your podcast. Um, you know, that had to be amazing with Andre and Michael Graham. I mean, uh, that's like getting Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier together after all these years. You know, what was funny, honestly, was, okay, we had Froggy Paparo on. And Froggy told us from his perspective, which was fascinating. Yes, and I've heard Coach, Froggy before. Yes. Right, and then Coach B, he said, he, he, he named names. He was like, oh, no, Larry Lumbaugh. And he said... He did this and he, 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 cause you know him, he knows the rules better than I think anybody. So he was calling on what it was. And it was funny, kind of talk about a 360 degree view of the whole thing. And it was, it was funny. And Andre and, and Michael Graham say, share the same birthday too. So they're actually pretty good friends to this day. So it's kind of, kind of an interesting circle. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, you mentioned Pearl, we talked about Pearl's half court shot against Boston College. Yep. And a few years back, they did a dedication. And they put a 31 right there at midcourt where he had launched yep. a shot. I was a little disappointed a couple of years ago when they did some changes to the court. Yep. They, and they moved, they removed it. And it's they gone. did it in part because they said, well, they now had all the retired numbers on the sideline. I didn't Not like that. I thought you, no. you do a dedication. He's like horrible. All right. So you horrible. agree with me. Uh, you're, horrible. You don't That's horrible. That's huge, huge. What's the word? Faux pas by the university? I, I don't know. That was, it was horrible. We were there. It was dedicated. And I know they asked Coach B because Julie and my wife are, are, are very tight and they talk a lot. So and he, they said, we're just going to have it on for the season. And his coach said, oh, no, that stays. So I know Coach fully supported that. Hmm. And I'm shocked to see it not there. And crushed, disappointed. You picked the word. I, I am. Very disappointed that my university took that off the floor. That belongs right there on that floor. And that means a lot to a lot of people. That dome is electric and exists, I think. And most people will say in part because we had Pearl Washington. Yeah, I, I thought 
markers like that mm-hmm. serve as like reminders to, to, to people, fans, younger fans, or, you know, the fans that saw the shot and then the fans that have come on later of what happened there. Yep. And like, there's a marker at, at the Baltimore Orioles stadium down there where they have the big warehouse. They have a marker where King Griffey was the first one to ever hit a home run on the fly off the warehouse. Well, you don't, after a few years, decide to take the Ken Griffey marker down, yeah, you know? Yeah, yep. I just, I, I think things like that are special. Yeah, and, they, and, uh, and, and, they, and they did, the ceremony and what they did in honor of Pearl was one of the best things I've ever attended the university has done. They, no, no holds barred, phenomenal. The people in attendance at the dinner, the people that spoke, mm-hmm. um, they were crazy. They asked me to speak, but, you know, Raph, um, yeah. Coach, you know, and it just was, you know, because <clears throat> I have trouble talking about Pearl without getting a little choked up. But the, the whole event, everything about it, every detail, the after the game, everything they did was first class. And I was never more proud of my school. And then to see that missing, that's 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 a swing and a miss. Well, maybe somebody up on the hill will hear this podcast and uh we can get that 31 in the circle uh, yep. back at midcourt. I'd love to see it. Right where it belongs. <laughs> well, and if not, we'll just keep banging the drum. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, when Pearl comes along, that changes things. You're, it does you're, for me. <laughs> yeah. Your junior, senior year, especially your senior year, you did not, your playing time went down. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, what was that like and how did you handle that? I didn't handle it as mature as I should have. Really? I'll say that right off the bat. Yeah. I'd love to tell you the story that I was great. I was, no, I was, I was a little pissed. You know, I was hurt. Um, I looked at possibly transferring my junior year. I was ready to graduate after three years. So in my mind, I could start going to dental school. I interviewed at dental schools. I was accepted in three of them. And one of them, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll transfer at Boston University. Maybe I'll transfer, play two years, you know, one year red shirt, one year play get two years of dental school covered and, you know, move on. But I I didn't. Um, It was a tough decision um, both ways to stay or to go. And Mm -hmm. for me, it was, okay, I'm going to have to accept my role. Um, I'm hopefully going to be at least in the mix for, you know, time or what have you. And, and, you know, a coach, if you're in the top seven, you're going to get time. If you're not, it's going to be very hard to get you, get yourself in the game. So, I remember when they named me a co-captain with Andre and I know coach had reservations about it. And I was like, well, he's probably not going to play. And I remember having that conversation and that was my decision. I had to be a man at the beautiful age. I think I was 20 um, that I had to be a man about it, you know, which ultimately he didn't say that, but that's, that's where it came down to. I had to accept my role. So we had young guys that had come in. Mm-hmm. We had, you know, Greg Monroe playing well. We had, you know, we had a, another group of guys. We had Mike Brown was a freshman, I believe. Um, so we had, you know, we had some talent in that spot. Now I'm over at the two now. I'm not really at the one per se, uh, but I could spell at the one. And I do remember, I think it was that year. No, my senior, I didn't play a lot. My junior year was half and half. I played a fair bit and then didn't play much. But my senior year, my time went down to, to next to that to next to nothing. So that's a tough pill to swallow. And, you know, but I, I said, okay, I, you learn from this and I did. And, you know, uh, it's hard when you're thinking you should be doing X, Y, Z and you're doing ABC, then it's tough with everybody's got a little bit of ego and confidence and to accept that role is hard. And I was not, I was not as good as I should have been in accepting that. What did you do? What do you mean you weren't good or about accepting it? Uh, it was tough. I mean, it was, it just, it just mentally, it was very hard to, to be fully engaged, you know, all the time. It was very tough. And, you know, it's just, you know, you had, because you were thinking selfishly, right? I wasn't thinking of the team. And, and when you're on a team sport, the team comes first and I've coached and, you know, you preach that and I hope that everybody does, but there's times and that's when you challenge, you know, who you really are. And it was tough. It was hard for me, but I got okay with it and I got better with it as time went on. You know, I, I don't have any apologies and, you know, anything that's, 
you know, and, and you know, people want to say, oh, your GPA and your and your points per game average, you know, blah, we want to make those jokes. That's fine. You know, Dick Vitale, you want to put me on your all airport team? That's fine. But you know, in the end, you have to have enough self-confidence and self-esteem to say, listen, I provide a value to this team. You may not see it, but this team is value is is better because I'm here. And and that's fine. And my role is different, and you don't have any idea what it is. So that's okay. You so it takes a while. Transferred. You, you could have graduated after your junior year and transferred. And then, like you said, with a red shirt year and then a, one more year of eligibility, had two years of dental school paid for. That has right. some value. Yes. Why? But you chose to stay. What's the value that you see now in having played four full years at Syracuse and having a Syracuse degree and not having been a transfer? I mean, does that, I mean, it seems like that would solidify your connections to this university, to the program. Well, I think that helped. I, I sure do. And uh, I look at now, if I see guys and I, I understand a lot of what they're going through, I've been there, you know, and, and a lot of guys, you start out sometimes your freshman year, you're not playing as much as you'd like, but you're going to grow into the role that a lot of guys go into. And there's some guys that never do. And, and they're still a valuable, important part of that team. You know, like just doing the alumni. Like I could have guys saying, listen, man, you weren't Jack when you played. Why am I listening to you? Well, it doesn't matter. Really, in the end, it doesn't matter. It's what you, you know, you get what you give, you know, what you give to the, to the program, what you give to the school and what you get back from your, you know, what you give to your brothers and, and, and teammates is what you get back. So I never looked at it like that anymore, but I do know that that was a fear, you know, but you get past that, you know, they're just, they're great guys. And that's, you know, the headlines are done, you know, we're done playing. And, and our roles are different. So if we can help the university, we can help with some of these kids. I know when Howard's um, nephew was playing, we, we had a couple of roundtables with the team. And I thought that was really helpful. And it was really interesting. In fact, when I heard Jeannie Waldron talk about his, his personal testimonial, I almost fell off my chair. I was like, Jeannie, we've been friends. I never knew any of this. And, you know, it was, it was very moving and, and, and emotional, but it was also a connection to some of these kids. And I thought it was very helpful. So sounds like I got to get Gene Waldron on the podcast. Yeah. You got to get Gene. Uh, Gene's great. Oh yeah. He's got a personal stories that he's, that he's dealt with. And he, he is, he is my favorite redemption story of all time. Just, I just, I can't say enough. And remember that was my competitor, right? He was the yeah. guy that had minutes that I wanted and we didn't, we were not close in college. Um, but now, I mean, I, he's a brother, you know, so I could talk to him about anything any day and I'm there for him. And I know he'd be there for me with anything. So you talked about being able to go off to dental school. Uh, if you wanted to, after your junior, you end up do, you did go to dental school. You, yep. you're why, why did you want to be a dentist? That's a good question. Um, I should have great answers because that's your first question on the interview. Why do you want to be a dentist? Um, <laughs> so I, I, I was always pretty good with my hands. And I like to work with kids. So I always thought, you know, maybe a pediatrician, maybe I'll do something like that, be a doctor. And, 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 you know, and then my dad said to me, why don't you be a dentist? You could have a better lifestyle. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about? No idea. I was like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. So from that moment on, I thought dentistry. Now I did not have a good relationship with my dentist, nothing personal. He just was very, Business, aloof, never spoke to me. Um, and I told him seventh grade, I was going to go to dental school. And he only said, well, yeah, I went to Buffalo. That's all he ever said to me. Twice a year went in, that's all he just told me. So I didn't have that. And everybody I talked to almost discouraged me, including when I met with Margaret Brown in, in, in college. She was like, oh, don't worry, you know, two out of three people drop. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with people? Why do people keep telling me to not be a dentist? So I think it's reverse psychology. I think it motivated me even more to do it. And I really do. And then, and then like the whole process of going to dental school. And then I, I contact the coach up there and I said, I would like to be a graduate assistant. And I know coach Bayheim. I don't know if he'll admit it, but I know he helped me get that job. Okay. And I got the graduate assistant position for four years at the university of Buffalo. We went division three, division two on our way to division one. And I remember going there and them saying, oh, you can't do that. You can't have a, you can't have a job. And I remember a professor saying, here's how we can do it. And I had a professor go to bat for me and, and we just started a scholarship. 
in his name because of what he did and just selfless, you know? So I had a four year graduate assistant job at university of Buffalo dental school. Very cool. And then you decided to move back home. Yeah. You're, you're a, you were a Southern tier kid and now you're back there in the Binghamton area. Yeah. You must like it. I do. I mean, I looked when I was graduating, before I graduated Buffalo, I had a good friend of mine who was named Chick Abdu. He was in the dental industry in, in Syracuse. And he took me on a bunch of interviews in Syracuse. And I remember meeting with a dentist downtown, Dr. Richard G. Russo, phenomenal guy. Lauren James was out in uh, Liverpool area. And those are two guys that I was really considering joining their practice. And then I started looking a little bit in my home area and I, there was a practice with two young dentists that I was best friends with the brother of the dentist. And again, I didn't know any, but Dennis really, nobody really counseled me or helped me. And that's where I chose to go. And then after two years, then I, I left that and went on my own. And that was, a, that was an eye-opening experience, but the, the, the things that I learned at Syracuse and the handling of adversity and the handling of good times and bad times really has helped me be better at what I do now. You never left basketball, really. I know that nope. you were the girls coach at Maine and well high school yep. for like almost 10 years. Yep. Nine years. What, what it. got you into coaching girls basketball at the high school well, level? <laughs> two daughters helps you. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, so you funny, coached your wife. girls. Yeah. Well, my, what's funny is my wife said to me, you've coached every year I've known you. So I got thinking about it. I was like, okay, dental school. I came home. I was working, you know, and I, and I started helping the CYO program at where the church we went to. And then little by little, I started helping different things. And then I got a, a kind of the program going at the school that my kids were going to go to. I started kind of a youth program. And then we started a travel basketball program, boys and girls. And then I got more involved on the girl side because I had a couple daughters coming up and my daughter, my oldest daughter who's 30 when she was second grader, she loved it. You know, she was a competitive stinker and she had, she was born with transposition of the great vessels. So she had open heart surgery at two days and four days old. And so we were like, Oh, we better be careful. But this kid, she was a daredevil. So I was like, we can't hold her back. She had the surgery so she could live a normal life. So I, you know, I got involved and I, you know, and then I got other great people involved and the program just blew up. So, you know, we have, we went from two teams to, we had like 11 teams by the time, you know, we had it going between third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Then you got modified and then you got JV and, and I coached the AAU program for 20 years. And we start, we started an AAU program in our area. Wow. And we wanted it to be, you know, to raise the level of basketball. So we got three, four varsity coaches from various high schools. They got involved. Uh, two of the assistant, two of the coaches at Binghamton University, Al Walker and Randy Dunton had daughters. So they could help, but they couldn't officially do it because they couldn't do anything basketball related. Right. But they were advisors. And so, you know, the idea was, hey, Binghamton doesn't have a central basketball, especially for girls. You know, boys was all over the map. So we wanted to organize it. So we did that. And we had at one point in time, we were at 20, 25 teams from 10, 10 U to 16 U, ABC levels all over the place. And then that, you know, that got going and that, you know, just I've stayed involved. And I'm still, I'm an assistant coach right now at my high school, boys, JV. I went back to the boys, which is the dark side. I like I like the girls, but I, I joke with some coaches who've done both, and they go, "Well, that's the dark side." Because boys don't listen like the girls listen. Yeah, and it's a different, a totally different thing. But it's fun. Both both sides have their have their rewards, and it's it's and it relates to my practice. I mean, I, I work with 30, 40 women, so well, sixty of them now, but you know, you, you, you have a team and, and you have roles and then the team works best when everybody's doing their role. And so it's, to me, it's, it's business and basketball just completely mix. And I don't think there's a lot of dentists that think basketball and dentistry are the same, but I do. And it's, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Now I'm not sure about this, and this is a dangerous thing to do as an interviewer is to ask a question that you're not completely sure of, but. Oh, you're not a prosecutor. Go ahead. <laughs> Your daughter, you have two daughters. Yeah. I heard one of them is a stand-up comedian. Yes, she is. I'm okay. That's my girl, Erica. Yeah. 
what's she doing? I mean, stand up comedy sounds fun, but I also know it can be hard. Yeah, there's there's no more of an ups and down job in in in, in the world than a stand up comedian. But you know what's really funny, Mike? So you you hopefully she is right. So you're a writer, right? So let's say after every paragraph, you had a group of fifty people that stood there and cheered or booed you, right? That's a stand up comedian. And every day it could be something different. So you, I mean, it's there's no more direct feedback than you stand in front of an audience. You're trying to make them laugh. Do they laugh? Don't they laugh? So the competitiveness in her has helped her because days she doesn't feel good, she gets up and works. Days that she's not. So that's helped her in that field. But when the pandemic came, that shut it down. I mean, New York City shut down. So that was hard. She was right on the edge. She had a a spot lined up on a national TV show. It was going to be her first TV appearance. So she was really kind of turning the corner. And, and major setback with things. And now things are getting back on the, on, on, the, on the up and up. She does a lot with Taylor Tomlinson, who's a very well-known female comedian. And Eric is her number two for warm-up. So if her number one guy or gal is not there, she goes. And she's, she's got a bunch of gigs lined up with her actually coming up in the next few weeks. And that's a lot of fun. So that's guaranteed. And then what she's done, because she doesn't sit still like me. So she took on her full-time job. And she's doing that. And now the comedy's picking up. So I'm like, well, you, you know, and she's like, no, no, no. I so, said, oh, yeah, okay, go girl. And so she's got full-time job and then she's doing the comedy. She's done funny bones up in Syracuse a couple of times. We've seen her. Um, yeah. So it's, and it's what's her fun. name again. Why do, what, so, so that I and other and Syracuse fans listening to this can look for her. Erica Spira. Erica Spira. Yeah. All right. That'll be easy to remember. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, good yeah, she's upset. Her. We gave her a name that doesn't allow a nickname. She was a little bit upset with us as a child. She's gotten over it, but <laughs> always go with Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah, right. Pac-Man. Yeah. Erica, Pac-Man Spira. There you go. I, I, I swear to God, I've never heard that that Pearl had a second nickname. Um, that's yeah. amazing. I love that. Yep. Sure um, did. and so well, so we're gonna tell everybody listening to this podcast, uh, look for Erica Spira on the comedy circuit. Yep. Uh, go out and cheer for her and laugh and support her. Uh, we're going to tell everybody to Big East Rewind podcast yep. with Sonny and former Villanova star or center or whatever, Chuck Everson. Yep. It's a good listen, folks. Uh, Thank you. Do, do, do Thank go you. listen to those guys. And so, Sonny, listen, um, this has been a pleasure. I appreciate you coming on my podcast and telling some of your stories. And um, even though, like I said, we're probably airing this after your alumni weekend. So it's already happened, but I hope when you come up for the Syracuse Louisville game that you and all the other uh, Syracuse alums have a really good time reconnecting with each other. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate the offer. Uh, Thanks for listening to this old man, but uh, I'm looking forward to reconnecting with my brothers and my people. And and we're going to have a good time no matter who shows, no matter how much snow or sleet is on the ground, we will be there. And we will make the most of it. And we'll support our guys, man. Never give up on our cues. Never. All day. Sounds good, Sonny. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.